<laughs> Homecoming is, what's it about? It's, it's kind of aimed at people who have already gone to college, right? And it's for them about remembering. It's about their memories of the good times they had in college, the learning they did, the, the time when, when they were becoming who they are, transformative experiences. Um, so what we want to do today is make some of those memories for you all um, and recognize some of our most outstanding students, the best and the brightest of the English department. So we're going to give three awards, one for poetry, one for, I guess what I would call analytic writing, critical writing, and one for fiction. The three award winners are, and please correct me if I don't say your name right, for poetry, the award winner is Jordan Michael Dolan. For uh, the best scholarly essay, the winner is Ashley Bernard. Barnard? Bar Barnard. Barnard. Mm -hmm. oh, I'm sorry, Ashley. Yeah. Pardon me. That's all right. I just met you a minute ago and I forget. Quite all right. And for fiction, Delaney to my right here. Delaney Kranz. So without any further ado, let me start with the awards. Okay. So as I mentioned, Jordan Michael Dolan is the winner of our Poetry Prize, and the title of his poem is, Who Were You When You Were Approaching the Ocean? So, Jordan, you want to read a little of your poem? Sure, yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay. So I submitted a bunch of poems trying to cast kind of a wide net uh, it looks like it worked. Um, <laughs> this one's actually titled, Who Were You When You Were the Approaching Ocean? <coughs> Who were you when you were the approaching ocean? And if you can manage, don't tell me about the abstraction of feeling. Tell me about the ghost foxes. The language spoken by the warring neighborhood cats. There is a real shortage of omens in any case. Did you have a lot of headaches before you were infertile? My Grammy married a man who carved apples out of corrugated metal. That's really the way he was, and I carry a bit of him. I carry the best of my genealogy. What part of me can give birth now? The worst parts of my genealogy took the best parts of my children. I know. I ask for no more abstraction. The mumps took the reproductive parts from my body and rendered them ornamental. You know, I think if I encountered a ribcage in the wild, not a body, just a ribcage, I would find it totally beautiful, the way the structure grows up from the forest floor, perfect protectorate. There are parts of our bodies that are beautiful, even in failure. See, I am familiar enough with the topography of the road to hell that I brought my church shoes. A joke here about lost souls, but we're supposed to try and be vulnerable. This is what I look like late at night. This is what I look like when I get bad news. This is what I look like when you look at me. Our next winner is for a scholarly essay, and that is Ashley Barnard. And the title of her essay is Missing Letters, John Updike's S, and Bharati Mukherjee, Mukherjee? I think so. Holder of the World as Counterwritings of the Scarlet Letter. So, Ashley. Thank you. For everyone's sanity, I pared down a 15-page paper to about three and a half pages. But I did keep the juicy bits in, so you're welcome. <laughs> in the postmodern and contemporary ages of literature, we've seen a growing trend of authors rewriting canonical texts. Critics are divided on the reasons why some authors are looking to make their own canonical, their own name canonical by associating it with authors of these classic works. Others say the purpose is to bring a fresh, hip, and therefore more accessible bent to the work, and others yet contend that it is to make a political statement. Lila Al-Sharki argues in her essay, The Rhetoric of Literary Rewriting, that these, these authors are all responding to an urge to revise the literary canon by rewriting it from an alternative cultural and political perspective. Al-Sharki focuses on four rewritings, and one of them is Bharati Mukherjee's the Holder of the World as a Retelling of the Scarlet Letter, which happens to be one of the most rewritten canonical texts. <clears throat> In comparing Holder of the World as well as another version of the Scarlet Letter, John Updike's S, 
I would argue that both of these modern novels work better as counter-writings as opposed to rewritings or retellings based on criteria I feel is critical to defining what a rewriting of the story is. What then defines a rewriting as opposed to a counter-writing? I believe there are three major components necessary for a successful rewriting. One, the original story has to be recognizable. The point of, re of a, a retelling usually is to show its universality. Two, the new story, however, should be set in a different culture or time period than the original, otherwise it's more of a rip-off than a retelling. A significant change in either plot, character, or setting needs to be needs to occur to give the new author a singular voice that offers a fresh perspective. And most importantly, number three, the new story should preserve the root story's most prominent themes. Again, it's about how the crux of the original story is timeless and universal. My definition of a counterwriting, on the other hand, is pulled from an essay, He Said, She Says, an RSVP to the male text by Christian Marot. What I find truly fascinating and worthwhile in closer scrutiny is primarily the kind of postmodern plagiarism where rewriting of past works steps beyond the jocular antics of earlier metafiction to fulfill culturally and politically specific functions. Late 20th century authors parasitize canonical, mostly white male works to take on values, hierarchies, and ideologies ingrained in them and, and lay out aesthetic and political alternatives. Simply put, the rewriting they perform often turns out to be a counter-writing, writing otherwise, a polemical, agenda-driven <coughs> form of intertextuality. So I will spare you many pages of how um, these two books, S and Holder of the World, meet the first criteria, first two criteria. There are many allusions to the Scarlet Letter in both works. And it's worth mentioning um, that Holder of the World is set very close to the time period of the Scarlet Letter but it takes place in India, and um, part of the, the Indian culture is in um, what's basically a harem of a Raja. So there's a lot of Hindu um, religion, religious context going on, which is um, very interesting because in Updike's S, which takes place in the 80s in Arizona, it also takes place in a Hindu um, ashram. So uh, it's, it's interesting that those two novels, while very different from The Scarlet Letter and also similar, both have these uh, Hindu aspects, which um, will be important later on in my minutes. Stop uh, improvising now. When they started out strong as successful retellings, these modern novels ultimately fail with their refusal to give their heroines a consequence for, for their adultery, thus failing criteria number three, which is maintaining theme. What these two novels do instead is give the character of Hester Prynne a voice, something she's denied in The Scarlet Letter, and thus they are counter-writings. In Hawthorne's story, we see Hester's defiance, bravery, and boldness in her actions, but she rarely speaks. In the two counter-writings, we see into her actual mind, a bolder, freer, modern Hester is revealed. Also, regarding Murat's argument that counter-writings fulfill culturally and politically specific functions, Transnationalism is achieved in both novels through the introduction of Hinduism, although in the case of S, it is more satirical and ironic. Updike plays up the hypocrisy and fraud of the Dimsdale character, while Mukherjee takes her Hindu Raja very seriously. Regardless, because of the lack of prohibitions on sexual expression in Hinduism, both Hester characters are sexually emancipated and emboldened and enter into adultery with open eyes, defiance, and a complete lack of regret. The sexual emancipation the women gain in these counter-writings is something Hester Prynne could not have conceived of. The sex in letter happens off stage, as it were, before the novel begins, and it's implied that Hester never enjoys it again within the quiet sol solitude of the rest of her existence. But by stark contrast, Hannah enjoys 14 days and 13 nights where the lovers abandon themselves to pleasure for, for 14 days this is a quote, the king mounted his lady without surcrease, no innocent posture, no contortion, failed to yield a new delight. And Sarah, in S, sits naked in a circle with other neophytes and cleanses each man's linga with the fire of her yoni, not to mention taking a lesbian lover and becoming the lover of the Arhat himself. But sexual freedom is just the beginning. Both women find autonomy in their newfound strength. Sarah sees the ashram for what it is, a sham, once the Arhat's true identity is revealed, and she strikes out on her own, still looking for love, but living alone by choice. Hannah becomes a true heroine, 
During the war between the Hindus and Muslims, she stops and kills General Murad Parha before his elephant can kill her friend Bhagmati, and watches with detachment when his own elephant crushes him underfoot. Then she has the courage to demand to see the conquering emperor and beg for peace. What I like best about these two novels, however, is their defense of Scarlet. For Hindus, the chakra that houses the Kundalini is the lowest chakra located at our base, the chakra that drives passion and sexuality. And this is significant as Kundalini is, is, has, is um, excuse me, <clears throat> is Sarah's new name in S. This chakra incidentally is red, and from there the chakra is built upward in a sort of inverted rainbow, with purple being above the head where one finds enlightenment. Before one can climb this stairway of spiritual evolution, one must first master each chakra, an achievement that begins with total surrender. Human sexuality is at the base of all humans, and by giving Hester a sexual freedom and expression, Updike and Bukherji have freed her from the purgatory that Hawthorne has confined her to for all eternity, the quiet place where she has thoughts that she ought not to think but no will to act upon. Because of Hawthorne's steadfast resolution that flesh and spirit are separate, one can never know God if flesh should meet with spirit, and thus heaven, salvation, enlightenment, or what you will can never be achieved. Perhaps Donald Grenier puts it best in his book, Adultery in the American Novel. If it's true that each generation must reread the classics in order to reinterpret the canon, then Updike's transformation of the Scarlet Letter is both an homage to a masterpiece and a radical feat of intertextuality. The American Protestant obsession with sex, sin, and salvation is no less frantic now than it was in the Puritan milieu of the Scarlet Letter, but Updike shows that the contemporary reconstruction of the body requires a reconsideration of faith. Arguing on the one hand for a conservative orthodoxy that denies the human effort reached to reach God, Updike insists on the other hand that the authorian separation of flesh and spirit is today an invalid interpretation of biblical text. His characters unify faith and fortification but never wear the A. We may wonder whether Hawthorne would have been pleased. Through Hannah and Sarah, Hester can master the scarlet chakra and begin her climb toward enlightenment now that the shackles of guilt and shame are broken. Thank you, Ashley. Our third winner is Delaney, Delaney Krantz, who um, is receiving the prize for creative, for, pardon me, for fiction. This category is fiction or creative nonfiction, and in this case, uh, it's for fiction writing. And her piece has an incredibly good title. It's called Your Sticky Plastic Seat. <laughs> so Delaney's gonna read a little of this for us. Um, and I'll turn it over to her. This is actually about the subways of Manhattan. My parents took me on a trip last fall and it was quite an experience to me because I've never really left Phoenix very much. It's the subway, shaking, quaking. They never seem to get the repairs right, no. It goes just long enough without a shriek of metal, a few moments, and you think it is safe, but then there is a slight turn in the tracks and the brakes yelp and wail. No, they never seem to fix anything at all. There was mold once, someone told you, and it shut the whole place down for a day. What a mess. They always try to make it convenient, of course. A few hours closed between one and three in the morning. But look at everyone around you right now. This place is never dead. There's always someone in need of a ride, of course, in a city such as this. Everything is shiny. Everything is dull. The walls were once an unscathed, an unscathed steel, but like everything, it tarnished. Hood rats and absent-minded fingernails scrabble every, sur every surface, edging human li life onto the doors, the poles, the seats, everything. Gang signs, Latin kings, a classic, and love signs, G plus A is heart, and vague remarks, Beth was here 2012, float on the walls around you, a mosaic of mindless graffiti. Nothing is untouched, nothing is sacred. It's the subway, and the air is as thick as your mother's sarcasm when you said you were going to the city. The water from the humidity sticks to everything. Skin, hair, it is all damp. The glinting metal of the walls are cool to the touch, but the unfathomable amount of bodies that have pressed against them make them repulsive. People avoid touching the walls, like some sick game of operation. How close can you get? How close can you get? Just don't touch, barely. The seats are optimal. People crowd on a throng of bodies, throwing themselves rag dolls with the target of the sticky plastic backs of chairs. The poles go next, appendages wrapping around their smooth metal in an act of dominance. This is my territory. Find a different spot. 
At least grimy poles are meant to be touched. The possibility of germs on them bothers no one. Leftover people cling to nothing, precariously balancing, forced to undergo sudden stops and starts. It's the subway, and it's loud, and it's silent. The brakes hiss and, and squeal, eee, switches in the tra track clanking, shh, 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 shh. mechanics shifting, shh. the people avoid eye contact. It's the subway, and there are three types. The working class, men and women. The men are in stiff suits, watching their dreams of abandoning dad's firm dissipate before their very eyes. Thanks, dad, for the Ivy League education, just so I could grow up and become you. Still clinging to briefcases out of simple tradition. The women are in dignified pantyhose, anticipating calls from Aunt Doreen. Are you in the suburbs? Have you found a man yet? Women get hurt in the city, you know and eager for another day of making their 77 cents to the dollar. When asked why they get up at such an ungodly hour, the working class shrugs. It's just another day at the grind. The tourists, weird, weirdly dressed parents of weirdly dressed children. Mom is stressed. She knows they're too little to really appreciate the city. Why won't Anne stop crying? Shh, shh, it's okay. Shh, shh, here's your binky. It's all right, shh. This day is getting off to a rough start. Dad is trying to put sunscreen on Tommy, but Tommy keeps trying to touch everything. Get up, the floor is dirty. God, just stop it, just stop it. When asked why they get up at such an ungodly hour, the tourists grin, heads bobbing. There's a whole day of planned activities ahead. The lurkers, do not speak to them. They occupy the plastic seats for hours and hours and days, sitting underground, riding back and forth on rusted rails. When asked why they get up at such an ungodly hour, it is simple, they've been there since yesterday. It's the subway, and you haven't made any friends yet, and you're not going to make them here. Your Fitbit sleep tracker buzzes furiously at your nightly four hours. Thankfully, the black coffee goes down without protest. Work starts in three hours, work where everyone's just a nameless face. Your new apartment's just a nameless place, but here, it's just the subway, and no person will bother you. You're here for ages every day, the only lurker who showers, back and forth on those rusted rails, your ass melding to your sticky plastic seat. Day, night, it doesn't matter, it's the subway. You'll have to face it sometime, the world. But for now, it's fine. Just sit, don't worry about it. It's fine, it's fine, it's fine. Shh, shh, it's okay, it's fine. Shh, shh, here's your binky, shh, it's all right. Okay, so let me give these to each of the three winners. Jordan. Oh, wait, I think I gave you two. <laughs> you only get one. All right. And Ashley, congratulations. Thank you very much. And to Delaney. That's a great line, your ass melding to the <laughs> that's, that's Thank good. you very much. So let's give another round of applause to our three winners.